All right. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning or good, good afternoon or good evening um, for Whitney. Um, my name is Lily. Um, I'll just be introducing the session a little bit. So some of you may have had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Gupta at our last conference in Denver. Um, in case there's anyone new here, I'll just give a brief introduction. Um, so Dr. Gupta is a pediatric dermatologist based in Seattle, Washington. Um, she specializes in CMN, as well as, of course, a variety of skin diseases. She's published research on pediatric CMN and other pediatric dermatologic dermatologic conditions, such as melanoma and other types of birthmarks. Um, so she is one of our experts who has a lot of experience working with Nidus Outreach. Um, so we're very excited and thankful for her to join us today as she talks about CMN, with, as well as an overview and treatment and different forms of management. Um, and like I said, she's based in Seattle, Washington. Um, Whitney? Yes, yeah, so this session will be functioning today as a webinar. That's why those of you who are joining us, you only see the, the panelists. And you'll be able to ask um, Q&As later after the presentation. So we'll let you know when that's happening. But um, you should see an option for Q&A. You can leave a question under your name, or you can also choose to be anonymous um, if you prefer to ask anonymously. We'll be um, addressing that later. So just so you're aware, that's... Um, that's how you can you can interact throughout the webinar. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, uh, Lily and Whitney, um, for the introduction. Um, I'm very excited to speak with you this morning. Um, Anivas Outreach is an organization that is near and dear to my heart, and um, and congenital melanocytic nevi are um, a area that I, you know, um, love to research about as well as, um, take care of patients. So, um, thank you for having me this morning. Uh, so I'm going to be talking today just about kind of an overview of, of, um, congenital melanocytic nevi. We'll talk a little bit about treatment and management, um, and then, um, have some time for questions. Um, so as we, um, uh, think about uh, congenital melanocytic nevi. We think about, um, you know, what's the kind of incidence. Um, and so, you know, overall, the incidence when we looked at the the literature can vary greatly. Um, you know, anything from less than one percent to almost thirty two percent is what's reported in in all the literature that's um, that's out there. But when we kind of really hone in that on that, the you know, true incidence of congenital melanocytic nevi, and these are kind of old types um, probably range from about, you know, less than 1% to maybe about three and a half percent. Most of the studies that are in the literature kind of focus more on um, uh, European um, countries, Australia and United States. And so this incidence that we have may be also skewed as we are not including um, the whole global population. Um, we know that when we look at congenital melanocytic nevi, we break them up by size. Um, you know, small being um, less than 1.5 centimeters, meeting, medium being 1.5 centimeters to 20 centimeters, and then large um, greater than 20 centimeters, and then giant greater than 40 centimeters um, body surface area. And when we look at the incidence, the small and medium sized congenital melanocytic nevi are definitely much more common than the large and giant. Uh, and the literature that we have um, kind of supports this as well. So when we look at a congenital melanocytic nevus, um, you know, the initial presentation um, during the neonatal period can actually change over time. And sometimes initially in that newborn period, the, the, the lesions may not look um, as kind of pigmented as we think. They may actually start off as being more red in color um, or red to brown, and then over time can sometimes develop and become more um, brown or even black in color. Sometimes initially, and I've seen this in, in my practice as well, in that neonated period, sometimes because of that red color, um, these congenital melanocytic nevi are actually confused as vascular lesions. Um, and then over time, as that brown color kind of evolves, um, and then they can be more um, clinically apparent. Uh, they sometimes initially can be more flat. Um, you can usually palpate them. You do, you do have some substance there. Um, uh, or sometimes they can have both kind of um, properties within, within the same nevus. And then the pigment, um, kind of, uh, can vary between, you know, one, um, uh, congenital melanocytic nevus 
in the same patient um, who may have multiple as well, but the color can definitely vary quite a bit. And, and we can see, you know, here on this leg, uh, here are two congenital monosignumi. They seem to be more in the small um, category based on size. And, you know, their, their presentations are different. One's being more, you know, ovoid round, the color more homogenous, the other one having more kind of a um, color where it's kind of broken up as well. And then even within one nevus as well, we see areas that are darker, areas where the pigment seems to be more dropping out, um, accentuation over um, hair follicles. And then the one on the top here, more hypertrichosis, more increased hair growth. So the, the um, presentations can be quite variable over time. Interestingly, what we also see is that as um, congenital melanocytic nevi evolve over time, and this is of any size, that the eventual color actually matches the um, pigmentation of the patient. And so I've seen this over time as well, where initially you might have a darker um, CMN, maybe more brown and black in color um, in an individual that might be redheaded or fair skinned, um, blue eyed. And over time, as they go um, into their teenage years um, uh, or later on in childhood, you'll see actually that color even evolve more to the, um, the pigmentation of um, the individual. So kind of lightening as well. So these CMNs definitely evolve over time. Hypertrichosis, um, increased hair growth can be something that we can see uh, throughout the nevus as well. Um, that can be present at birth. It can develop later on in life as well. We can see that texture of the hair sometimes evolve, um, become more coarse, more thick um, and darker. Um, and that can either be present at birth or it could kind of evolve over time or as um, individuals go through puberty um, where there's a lot of changes in hormone. And so with all these changes, it's really important to kind of continuously monitor um, congenital melanosic nevi over time, um, establishing with a dermatologist who can um, uh, evaluate that nevus, palpate that nevus um, is, is really important. And then we know that these congenital melanocytic nevi are oftentimes not picked up on any prenatal ultrasounds or um, there's not any markers or any um, anything that we kind of sometimes um, pick up on prenatally. And so they oftentimes are, the first time we see them is um, at birth. We expect that these congenital monastic nevi to grow proportionally over time. Um, and then as I kind of mentioned, uh, they can actually lighten to the, the patient's background skin pigmentation um, as the ultimate kind of color um, of that nevus. So um, as I mentioned before, you know, if an individual has more red head, uh, fair, red haired, fair skinned, blonde in color, you'll see that nevus kind of lighten to their um, eventual color. Um, and then uh, as we kind of mentioned as well, that that nevus is going to kind of change in its pigmentation. It can become more mottled or speckled. Sometimes it can become more homogenous, so more even. Um, and then you'll notice darkening and lightening maybe of individual spots. Um, over time, not only um, that the hair growth can change within a nevus, but sometimes they can get thicker, more kind of what we call verrucous or wart-like, um, sometimes uh, have um, areas that are more raised or nodular, um, that can also happen over time. Um, one thing that I thought was interesting is that uh, this is a, a study that they looked at um, um, the satellite nevi or what we call um, a kind of smaller congenital melanocytic nevi. And, um, and then they also looked at those smaller kind of congenital melanocytic nevi, those satellites as we used to call them. Um, those are something that can develop over time as well. And uh, sometimes an individual may have um, a few at birth and then over time might develop um, more of them over the first uh, couple of years of life. And um, in this study, they took little biopsies of those small congenital nevi and they looked at where the pigmentation is. Um, there's some thought, you know, do these... Um, congenital melanocytic nevi, do they seem to arise deeper down in, in the skin structures, like in the dermis, or do they arise more um, superficially and then kind of grow downward? And in this study, they when they did the biopsies of kind of smaller ones, um, you know, measuring maybe less than one and a half centimeter versus the medium um, uh, congenital melanocytic nevi that are more 1.5 to 20 centimeters, and then the larger ones, they actually found that um, 
Uh, the smaller ones, the pigmentation is more and more superficial in the epidermis. But then as they got larger, that pigmentation kind of dropped down into the deeper structures um, of the skin, kind of showing that things kind of maybe arise more in the, in the superficial layers for these um, satellite lesions that we, um, uh, as we call them. Um, and then they, it kind of, uh, those melanocytes be, make nests, um, make nodules and kind of delve deeper over time. So um, that's one thing that we kind of talk about is the small congenital melanocytic nevi, these satellite nevi, how do they evolve? How do they develop? Um, and it seems like they develop more in the superficial layers of the skin and then, and then become deeper. You know, the thing that we worry about the most, um, we talk about the most is what is kind of the true risk of melanoma in these congenital monastic nevi. And this really is um, one large piece at what drives um, some of the treatment decisions we make or um, some of the worry around congenital monastic nevi. And, you know, when we look at the lifetime risk of melanoma um, developing within a um, congenital monastic nevus, it's actually overall fairly low. Um, but the risk really um, depends on the size of the nevus, um, which with the larger or um, more giant nevi having a larger risk of developing melanoma. When we looked at all the literature, um, the incidence that's reported is kind of anywhere between 0.7% and 2.2% for all, um, all types of congenital monastic nevi. So that means even from the small, the medium, the large, or the giant. Um, and then when we look at, you know, the giant uh, congenital monocytic nevi, ones that we think of involving more than 40% of the body surface area, you know, the estimates of melanoma risk um, are higher in that group, maybe ranging from three to 8%. When we look at the, those, um, uh, that group in particular too, sometimes the risk is um, higher in younger years. Whereas when we look at small and medium sized uh, congenital monocytic nevi, the risk of developing a melanoma sometimes tends to be kind of um, in puberty um, uh, or kind of later in childhood. Um, neurocutaneous melanosis is also something that we kind of consider. And what that, um, the definition for that is basically neural melan mel melanosis. So increased pigmentation of the um, leptomeninges, the cerebral cortex, um, kind of within the brain parenchyma, we see deposits of the melanocytic cells in these locations. And um, looking at the literature, the incidence, again, is really skewed um, for the true incidence of um, neurocutaneous melanosis. And it can range from anywhere from 18%, 17% to 41%. Um, but the reason that this is probably not a true incidence is that you know we don't um, always image every single individual with um, a congenital melanocytic nevus. And so what um, the literature that we have is kind of skewed to the ones that we are um, imaging. And so when we think about melanoma and um, uh, neural um, um, melanosis, um, neurocutane, um, we think about those being more likely in individuals that have larger congenital melanocytic nevi. So those that have um, giant um, congenital melanocytic nevi, ones that are greater than 40 centimeters in diameter, um, body body surface area involvement, or those have that have more numerous, and I'll put in quotations here, satellite nevi. You know, we more term this as multiple congenital melanocytic nevi. Um, if they have more than twenty of those small congenital melanocytic nevi, that was also considered to be a stronger risk factor for developing neurocutaneous melanosis or neural melan um, melanosis. Um, more central or truncal involvement of the congenital melanocytic nevus um, has also been linked to increased neural melan uh, melanosis, as well as multiple medium-sized congenital melanocytic nevi. Um, and, you know, individuals that have more congenital melanocytic nevi are considered to be um, at kind of a higher risk for um, development of neurocutaneous melanosis. And so um, that's kind of what the literature kind of um, shows us. And you know, there's no, um, uh, in a recent study that I did with a group um, 
uh, uh, pediatric dermatologists, um, as well as other experts in the in the field, when we looked at neurocutaneous melanosis risk and who should be imaged, um, you know, there's not one true expert opinion that that comes out. But in general, some of the recommendations are um, to get an MRI of the brain and spine if an individual has multiple congenital melanocyte nevi, um, at least greater than 10 um, in the neonatal period, um, having a giant congenital melanocytic nevus, um, um, or uh, you know, having more than one medium-sized, um, at least medium-sized congenital melanocytic nevus um, have been have been things that have been reported in the literature and and um, some recommendation around. And even if you find neural uh, neural melan um, melanosis on MRI, it does not mean um, that it will cause any symptoms. Um, sometimes it can be symptomatic um, or it can be asymptomatic. The symptoms that we oftentimes associate with neural melan melanosis are um, things like seizures, headaches, um, rapidly enlarging head circumference, um, hydrocephalus, meaning increased pressure within the head, um, uh, and any kind of developmental kind of delays. And so, um, so those are um, things to kind of uh, watch for as well. Um, so now I'll just um, transition from kind of overview into kind of talking about some of the treatment options that are described um, uh, in the literature. And, you know, treatment is um, something that is not um, completely clear cut. It's really, um, something that is a shared decision between um, the patient, the family, the caregivers, um, the healthcare team. And um, it's really about getting education about the treatment options that are out there. Um, the kind of, um, uh, you know, what that means for an individual, what what they have to undergo for that process and what the eventual outcome could be. Um, and what's the evidence behind that? What are the risks? Um, what's, um, and what are, what's the capacity or the ability um, of that family and that patient to be able to undergo some of the treatments? And so there's um, a lot of education, a lot of um, preferences, a lot of um, uh, that, and a lot of discussion that kind of really comes around treatment. And it's um, not a perfect fit for every family. There's not one treatment option that that is perfect for each individual. Um, it really kind of all these pieces go into what makes sense for you as an individual, you as a family, um, and um, and. And this is an ongoing, you know, discussion that we have every day uh, with every visit as far as what, you know, what makes um, the most sense as far as treatment. And so I'm just going to go through some of the treatment options that are out there, um, some of uh, the literature, what it highlights, um, and then um, and then some kind of novel treatments that are kind of um, out there as well. And, and then we can kind of hopefully have some time for questions as well. Um, so with um, large, uh, with any kind of size congenital melanocytic nevus, um, you know, surgical management is one large area that um, that should be considered. And there's a lot of um, discussion about serial excision um, uh, to help with kind of decreasing melanoma risk, decreasing um, kind of burden of disease, helping with psychosocial um, kind of distress related to the uh, congenital melanocytic nevus. And serial excision, what that means is that um, essentially um, some part of the congenital melanocytic nevus is removed um, and then uh, the area is um, sutured back up. Uh, and then at a later date, um, uh, another excision can be done. Um, Sometimes these excisions are done with tissue expansion where um, kind of a, a, a balloon tissue expander is placed underneath the skin to stretch the skin out so that the skin has more laxity, um, you're able to remove more of it and then able to kind of close uh, an area with suturing more effectively. Um, and so this has been widely um, talked about and looked at in the literature. Sometimes this is done, serial excisions can be done for any size uh, congenital melanocytic nevus, and it sometimes does not need tissue expansion, um, but uh, oftentimes, depending on the location and the amount that 
is being excised. Tissue expansion is also done with it. And sometimes even grafting of the skin where skin is maybe harvested from um, another side of the body and placed um, on an area to help it close um, uh, as well. So serial excision with or without tissue expansion. Um, here we're talking about the tissue expansion um, idea as well to try to uh, stretch out the overlying um, tissue of tissue so that more of it could be removed and the area could be closed more effectively. Um, one thing to um, note is that, you know, uh, in the past few few years, there's been a couple of um, great case series just kind of highlighting the surgical act outcomes and like the psychosocial impact um, of these surgeries on patients and families. And um, this is one study that was in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery back in 2021, where they looked at individuals with giant congenital melanocytic nevi and um, had a single center um, case series of 136 patients that they looked at um, over a few decades. And they um, talked to patients about, you know, or they measured kind of quality of life um, as well as um, just what patients and caregivers kind of stated about the surgery. And they found that, you know, the surgeries, um, you know, did have some impact on quality of life, um, but uh, about 70% in this study, at least, felt like the the surgery itself had more of a, you know, a minor impact on their quality of life. Um, but the individuals that had higher satisfaction with the surgeries were um, ones where the surgery was done within the first year of life. Um, they kind of had a higher um, kind of uh, satisfaction or higher quality of life impact. Um, and also the surgeon satisfaction with the surgery was higher when that, when the surgeries were done, um, earlier on. And so in this, um, study, the things that were highlighted were maybe, um, discussing, you know, or talking about, um, surgical outcomes, um, or surgical treatments earlier on, or being offered maybe them sooner, but knowing that even in, in this case series, you know, the large majority kind of thought that surgery did have some impact, but maybe a, a more minor impact on their quality of life. Um, and so this kind of goes to the idea of kind of really shared decision-making and kind of looking at um, that, that all options are not, um, you know, that the risks and benefits of each option really do have to be kind of weighed with each family as well. And then um, this study I thought was really interesting in the journal of Craniofacial Surgery back in 2022, so about a year ago. Um, they really looked at the psychosocial experience um, in children with um, CMNs um, that were specifically in the head and neck area uh, and um, had surgical excision with tissue expansion. And they looked at the experiences of children and parents and um, found that, you know, Individuals with um, large size congenital medical neva, the head and face, were definitely prone to a lot of psychosocial distress, um, uh, social um, and emotional distress. And parents also experienced um, that same, you know, emotional distress. And, and um, that's definitely been, you know, my experience speaking with um, families and patients um, that, you know, it is it is quite distressing. Um, they uh, these individuals in this study here went through um, tissue expansion and went through surgical excision. And um, what patients and parents um, experienced during that time of tissue expansion and treatment was there was a lot of um, psychosocial kind of distress and fluctuation during that time too. And the period um, of continuous expansion right before the lesion was resected actually patients and families showed the most severe levels of distress um, at that at that time um, in both the children and in the parents. This did improve um, and decrease uh, about six months after surgery, but just to highlight that these um, interventions can uh, really be um, difficult. They can be distressing. They can be um, sometimes socially isolating, um, and, and cause a lot of emotional distress around, around them as well. And so, um, that should all be weighed into, into the decision, um, for each individual patient and family. And so one thing that this, um, study kind of highlights is just that, you know, I think patients and families, uh, during this time, as they're 
deliberating between if surgical treatments make sense or not, that they really um, should be given more support um, uh, around these times, um, both kind of emotional support more, support, more education. Sometimes families are also traveling for these procedures. And so um, during that time, just really an intervention that would be helpful for, for families would be um, to have more kind of um, social support as well. Um, this is just a series of pictures from one um, uh, study that looked at about almost 120 cases um, retrospectively. Um, and these were more for small and medium sized um, congenital melanocytic nevi, but I think some of it could be applied even to large um, or um, giant melanocytic nevi, or definitely the um, multiple um, small congenital melanocytic nevi that we see sometimes in association with larger giant um, CMNs. And here this study kind of looked at using excision by itself, um, excision with laser treatment, um, both for scars and for uh, pigmentation removal, and then laser itself. And the reason I highlighted this um, surgery is, or this um, article is that I think it kind of goes through some of the issues that we kind of go back and forth about when we think about excision, when we think about, uh, and, and we think about laser use too. I think there's a lot of um, literature or, or sometimes a lot of um, uh, suggestion that laser could be something that could be really helpful in, in congenital melanocytic nevi. And I think that it, laser treatment should be used very, um, you know, can be considered as an adjuvant treatment um, in addition to excision. Uh, but there are some risks that we should definitely highlight as well. So um, and this is an individual that has a um, kind of medium-sized congenital melanocytic nevus on the right um, temple and uh, went through excision um, uh, by itself. Um, and th this was done actually in a staged excision. So um, essentially in three different stages, um, smaller uh, sections of the nevus was removed. So one excision was done, uh, the areas sutured up, allowed to heal. Um, and then usually about um, uh, six to maybe eight weeks later, um, a little larger area was um, taken out around the initial scar. Uh, and this was done three times um, over an 11 month period. And you can see in, in the middle picture, that's how things looked um, after the three stage excisions. And then in the last picture, that's um, uh, almost a year after the last excision, um, we can see the scar kind of healing well. And so that's just serial excision um, and, um, in, in this individual um, had a fairly good outcome uh, with just scar formation. Um, this individual went through uh, stage excision as well, but um, you can see the scar that was forming in the middle picture. And they also went through some laser treatment just for scar um, remodeling. And so with the, the CO2 um, laser and the co copper bromide laser, really just focusing on scar improvement, um, I, there's less kind of nodularity and less redness in this individual and had the eventual outcome in, in, in the last picture there and see. So sometimes um, excision with laser treatment specifically for scar treatment, um, improvement of the scar can be, can be helpful. Um, and then this individual had um, excision, um, but given the complexity of the location of the CMN being right near um, the tarsal plates um, kind of going into the uh, conjunctival um, space of the eye. They had excision, but then also used a laser for pigmentation. Um, and you can see that the even after both of those, and part of it is because of the location of this CMN, the complete pigmentation could not be removed, um, uh, but some uh, lightening um, was possible as well as some um, uh, removal of the lesion. And then this is an individual in this study that went through laser only. And um, I just wanted to highlight this because I think it's um, kind of mirrors what we see in practice, um, which is this individual has a CMN on the forehead, um, laser treatment was used. And so they had 15 sessions of 
um, two different types of lasers that were used to remove the pigmentation. And after those 15 sessions, uh, what's present is what's in the middle picture in B. And so there is definitely um, decreased um, lightning and um, less overall appearance of the of the CMN, but you can still see there's some pigmentation left. Um, it's a little bit more mottled and speckled. And then after about eight years, there was recurrence of that pigmentation, um, which is what you see in the in the far picture in C. And what this highlights is that the laser, you know, in, in congenital melanocytic nevi, we see that those melanocytes are not just on the surface of the skin, but they actually are going deeper down into the dermis, sometimes into the sub, subcutaneous tissues and fat. And sometimes they can even go down into, into muscle, um, into deep fascia. And the laser lasers can't penetrate that deeply. They usually penetrate a few millimeters into the skin. And so they can only target more of that pigmentation more on the surface. And so even after 15 sessions for this patient, you know, not all of the pigmentation could be removed. And those deeper melanocytes um, were, you know, were not being able to be kind of uh, targeted. And so therefore over time, the pigmentation does come back. And so this is, you know, one thing that we think about with laser treatment is um, what our eventual goal is. And then if there's going to be, you know, any ill effects of, of laser. So the main thing that we think about is, you know, is this nevus going to be harder to, um, to be able to follow over time? And so um, that and recurrence oftentimes is likely just because those deeper monocytes um, can't be targeted because the laser just doesn't go that deep. You know, when we do think about laser, I think there are um, a couple of myths to kind of dispel and um, a couple of uh, things to address. So um, to date in the literature, there's been no malignant transformation transformation that's been um, associated with laser use um, in the congenital monocytic nevus. So if you use laser, um, there's been no reports of uh, increased melanoma risk or increased malignancy with the use of laser in CMNs. Um, one thing that lasers have been really helpful in is hypertrichosis, so the increased hair um, growth within within the CMN. This can be really distressing to patients. It can cause increased itching. Um, it, uh, the um, color or the texture of the hair can also be distressing. And so laser hair removal is something that's widely done for various conditions and can be done in congenital melanocytic nevi as well. One thing to note is that with laser hair removal, um, one session oftentimes is not enough. Um, you oftentimes do a series of treatments ranging from kind of six to 10 treatments to kind of really remove the hair within an area. And um, the hair can come back over time. Oftentimes it is lesser in density, lesser in um, coarseness or thickness. Um, but that's one one use of lasers in congenital melanocytic nevi. And then for complete removal of the nevus, um, you know, I think that as we just saw in the previous photos, um, I think that um, it's difficult to completely remove the nevus just because the laser itself can't get down to where all the melanocytes are. And so therefore there is risk of recurrence. Um, sometimes you can use lasers for scar revision, as we just saw um, in conjunction with excision. Um, and then sometimes in areas that are really cosmetically sensitive, I think discussing again, um, that shared decision-making um, with family and patient is important to kind of talk about the roles um, uh, or, you know, the, the goals of, of treatment and what you're hoping to achieve. Um, sometimes if a congenital melanocytic nevus is, you know, in a really prominent visual area, sometimes that, you know, could be that laser might lighten it, um, uh, make it less apparent. It it likely will reoccur, um, and there might be some um, less uniformity of the pigmentation, uh, and sometimes that can make it more difficult to follow as far as um, you know a risk of malignant transformation to melanoma. So all things to kind of consider when you're when we're talking about. Um, you know, the idea of kind of lightening um, the congenital melanocytic nevus, because I, I I think that the lasers don't really fully remove the nevus um, and remove that uh, melanoma risk. So um, with a lot of these treatments that we just talked about with surgical excision and laser, um, you know, with surgical excision, 
we may be kind of decreasing the bulk um, or the burden of melanocytes in an area, but likely not you know, removing that risk of melanoma 100%, and especially in large and giant congenital melanocytic nevi. Um, sometimes those melanocytes might be deeper um, and we may not be removing every single one. So something to kind of consider um, when we're thinking about our goals. Um, you know, one thing that, you know, over the last decade or so, we're, we're learning um, a lot more about the genetics um, of congenital melanocytic nevi. And this has been really fascinating um, in kind of large and giant um, congenital melanocytic nevi, we've found that a lot of the mutations tend to be in NRAS. Um, and this mutation kind of leads to activation of um, a pathway in MAP kinase and PIC, um, uh, uh, P, um, uh, PIC um, K pathway, uh, pathways. And these pathways ultimately increase the proliferation and survival of melanocytes. And we've also seen um, similar kind of genetics around BRAF mutations, again, also kind of activating um, the MAP kinase pathway, which leads to more proliferation and survival of, of melanocytes. And so as we know more about these genetics, we've um, kind of looked at more targeted approaches um, to um, medical therapies. Um, and so you know, we've talked a little bit about surgical therapies, laser, and then I think medical therapies are something that um, more and more uh, studies are being done on. And so this was um, uh, something that just came out in Cell in 2022, kind of looking at the mutations within congenital um, kind of giant melanocytic nevi and um, looking at some topical um, MEK inhibitors, um, uh, PIK, um inhibitors, CKIT inhibitors, and then squaric acid. Um, and so looking at the mutations that, we, that we've that we found in congenital melanocytic nevi and seeing if there is topical treatments that might inhibit that um, mutation pathway. And so uh, when they looked at the MEK inhibitors and the PIK3 um, uh, kinase inhibitors, um, they found actually that when they applied that to the skin, there was more of this kind of depigmentation vitiligo kind of like effect where the color was actually reduced. Um, and then the, in this study specifically, they looked at squaric acid, which um, causes inflammation. It's um, kind of a haptin that uh, can be applied to the skin and, and can cause inflammation. And they found that when they applied this to the skin, um, uh, that there actually was um, kind of a decrease in the melanocytes in an area, which was really, um, really promising. They did this in mouse models specifically. Um, so they made um, mouse models and then applied um, these topicals to this area. And so this is the visual um, of this article where they, in the top picture, they looked at before treatment, the nevus um, and the melanocytes, they applied the squaric acid to the skin that caused increase in inflammation, increase in cytokines and chemokines um, and brought in macrophages, which is, um, uh, and those um, actually kind of um, decreased um, and kind of resolved a lot of the um, melanocytes within the nevus, which was um, really fascinating. Uh, there's, a, you know, a lot this was done in a mouse model. So translating this into, into human practice, um, you know, as far as dosing and if we're going to get the same response um, uh, are um, questionable, but um, really kind of interesting knowing the genetics of the channel monosic nevi and um, using topical treatments. Um, um, so perhaps more and more medical therapies will also be out there, perhaps can be used in addition to surgical treatments um, or procedural um, kind of treatments. Um, so I think a lot of interesting things that are that are happening. Um, and then this was one uh, case report in a seven-year-old girl who had a lot of kind of pain, um, itching, um, uh, increase in nodularity uh, within her congenital monocyc um, uh, And this is her in A, B, and C. This is her from eight months of age um, to, uh, to about seven, six years of age. Um, that's the progression from A, B, and C. Um, and you can just see that there's just a lot more nodularity, a lot more bulk. The color of the nevus overall um, is darkening. Um, and this caused her a lot of kind of pain and itching. And so um, the a mutation or a genetic analysis was done of her 
giant congenital myelocytic nevus, and she was found to have a BRAF mutation. She was given oral trematinib. Um, trematinib is a MEK inhibitor, um, and the we know that the BRAF and BRAF mutation activates the MAP um, ERK um, kinase pathway um, and uh, MEK inhibitors act on that pathway. And so in D, um, after about six months of treatment on trematinib, um, 0.5 milligrams daily, she actually had a lot less itching. She was able to be taken off of a lot of um, her antihistamines. Um, when they did an MRI at six months um, with oral trematinib, they found that the dermis was less thick. Um, invasion of the congenital myelocytic nevus into the muscular spaces um, resolved. And we can see visually that there is kind of less nodularity, less of those kind of proliferating nodules kind of throughout um, and kind of less tissue bulk um, throughout, which was also um, seen on MRI. So, um, you know, these medications do have side effects, um, do need to be monitored. And um, it's unclear what, what the, you know, long-term outcomes on these medications are, as well as how long we keep patients on these medications. Um, but sometimes for certain um, significant symptoms, um, uh, use of these medical treatments is, um, can be, can be promising and helpful. Um, and then I just wanted to kind of go through some management pieces. So this was a article that, um, uh, a group of us pediatric dermatologists over many years, um, uh, um, put out and it's um, kind of care of congenital monocytic nevi, specifically in the no newborn and infant population. But I think a lot of these um, management recommendations are really applicable um, throughout the time. And um, this was published in pediatrics in 2021. And, you know, we looked at the literature, we looked at um, almost 2,500 articles and we selected kind of a little bit over a thousand that showed um, some, um, you know, information. And overall the there's not a lot of evidence out there um, as far as expert recommendations. Um, there's no randomized controlled trials, but looking at the literature as well as um, our experiences, these were some of the recommendations that um, were put out. And so this is the table from that article. Um, I urge all of you to kind of look at it um, and kind of have it handy. I think it's a great reference. Um, and, you know, skincare is something that we talk a lot about um, and, Again, the our expert kind of opinion was as far as bathing, um, you know, uh, at least two to three, two to three times a week. Um, the main thing with bathing is that you're hydrating the skin, um, and you don't want to let the skin dry out after bathing. And so, application of moisturizers, um, especially after bathing, are really important. In general, um, soaps, uh, sometimes more harsh soaps or or products with fragrances or dyes can be more irritating to the skin and cause maybe more irritation or itching. And so in general, bathing kind of with water alone, um, you can use kind of a non-soap based cleanser, something more mild that's easier to wash off um, and definitely not using anything with fragrances and dyes. Um, xerosis or dryness of the skin, especially within the congenital monocytic nevus is a really frequent um, concern. And so using emollients um, regularly as, as well as after bathing is really important. Um, and then itching pruritus is, is really common. Um, sometimes you can get more than just dryness, um, which can cause itching, but you can also get inflammations, kind of red, um, kind of inflammation within the nevus. And so not only using um, emollients to help prevent this, but sometimes even topical steroids um, uh, are needed to kind of calm down that inflammation. Um, we do find that the, the skin of the nevus sometimes can be a little bit more fragile, can be sometimes more prone to um, trauma, and sometimes it takes longer for that, that area to heal. Um, so one thing to do um, would be if an area does have an open wound to clean it um, gently with some soap and water, and then actually using um, a petroleum jelly based or like a bland emollient. Um, so something that's clear and greasy, applying it to the open wound and then bandaging it and keeping it covered um, actually aids in wound healing. Um, and sometimes you can use topical or oral antibiotics, but that's really only if the area looks infected. So if there's kind of yellow crusting, expanding redness, um, those would be things that can be done. Um, if something is not healing, 
healing like you would expect it to. So we'd expect most wounds to kind of show signs of healing over the next few days um, and maybe be healed, you know, over a few weeks time. If something seems like it's constantly being opened up, not healing, um, then I would biopsy it and kind of assess it for, for a malign malignancy. That is one um, kind of sign of something's not healing or bleeding really easily um, to kind of assess it for, for malignant transformation. Um, we do see that there's reports of kind of decreased um, sweating within congenital monoxidic nevi. So thinking about avoiding overheating, cooling techniques such as mister sprays, um, wearing more cotton, breathable clothing um, can all be things that can be helpful. And then photo protection. Um, so there's not any specific um, studies that ex examine the effect of UV radiation on congenital nevi, but in general, we recommend um, a good sunscreen use and sun protection um, using photoprotective clothing, such as rash cards and hats. Some um, that have SPF embedded within, the, within it can be helpful. Then you can focus on sunscreen, um, at least SPF 50 on areas that are exposed. One thing to know is that sunscreen is not waterproof. Um, it's um, completely waterproof. And so it does need to be reapplied every 90 minutes to two hours if you're out in the sun. Um, and then as far as referrals, you know, congenital monosic nevi should definitely be um, referred and followed by with by a dermatologist. Um, pediatric dermatologists have kind of specific expertise in CMNs, but dermatologists um, that see C a lot of CMNs too um, could be great to follow with as well. Um, and I would, you know, establish care in the newborn period, especially if you have a larger giant congenital monosic nevus. I think ones that are smaller, medium in size um, don't have to be referred immediately, um, uh, but definitely should see a pediatric dermatologist or dermatologist with expertise um, at some point in time, and then continue to be followed um, over time. And the main things that we do during the exam are, you know, we inspect the nevus, we palpate the nevus, we palpate the lymph nodes, um, and then we can also look with our dermatoscopes, these special tools um, at the networks of pigment um, in the nevus itself to see if there's anything concerning. With large and giant CMNs, the recommendation is to, at least within the first um, year of life, um, see each other maybe every three months or so. And then that can be um, uh, decreased as far as frequency after that first year of life. And if any concern arises, such as nodularity, areas that are friable, bleeding, um, any pain or symptoms within the nevus, um, uh, any changes to color or texture um, or symptoms within it, um, those would be, you know, things to maybe alert your, your, um, care provider about. Um, and this is just kind of an algorithm that we kind of, you know, think about, um, you know, we think about if, um, if you have a smaller, um, medium-sized uh, CMN and there's any kind of concerning lesions within it, we would definitely recommend something, um, as far as biopsy or sometimes even excision of the entire nevus, if that was possible. If the exam was reassuring, um, then just continued monitoring. And sometimes with the small and medium-sized CMNs, um, those can be monitored by primary care doctors um, after initial visit with a, with a dermatologist, um, and then maybe checking in kind of at times of growth or times of change, such as puberty, um, or, or if there's any kind of worrisome features. With you know multiple medium or large or giant congenital monosic nevus, you know getting in to see a dermatologist with expertise or a pediatric dermatologist initially. Sometimes we consider that MRI of the brain and spine um, in certain kind of cases um, uh, initially, and um, if you know any findings were found on MRI to kind of make sure you also get. Um, neuroradiology and radiology involved as well as um, neuro kind of development. Um, if it was negative, maybe continuing to observe and then um, observing that nevus, having regular follow-up, if there's any changes in the nevus, considering biopsy and then repeating that MRI if, if, um, if needed, maybe even times of growth such as puberty. Um, besides dermatologists, um, 
getting, you know, neurologists involved, especially if there's any neurocutaneous melanosis, um, ophthalmology um, involved for kind of a baseline eye exam. Um, there are a small subset of patients that sometimes can have um, endocrinologic abnormalities, um, kind of with growth or thyroid, and so getting an endocrinologist involved, and then um, a psychiatry team if needed as well. Um, we talked a little bit about um, neurocutaneous melanosis and um, getting an MRI um, and focusing that on individuals that might have a giant congenital monocytic nevus, um, greater than 10 smaller um, kind of satellite lesions um, with a large congenital monocytic nevus or multiple medium congenital monocytic nevi. Um, the uh, tissue of the brain gets myelinized um, kind of within the first six months. And so it gets sometimes harder to evaluate this area. And so trying to do an MRI in these high risk kind of populations earlier on um, can be really helpful. And, um, but if any of you have had an MRI, it does require um, some, you, you can't really move during them. And so uh, over the first two to three months of age, when babies sleep really soundly. Sometimes we can do a feed and wrap MRI and, and avoid general anesthesia um, and still get uh, fairly good pictures. And so this is something to um, get in to see your pediatric dermatologist or your specialist um, early on. So these can be kind of, um, uh, this type of imaging can be done early on um, and, and intervened upon um, if needed. And then as we kind of talked about surgery and procedures, um, this is really a place of shared decision-making. Um, uh, and, you know, sometimes um, no surgical management is fine as well. Um, conservative, conservative management of large and giant CMNs is definitely um, something to, to consider as well. And so it's really about what makes the most sense um, for that patient, that family, and um, that treatment team. And then we did talk about hair removal with laser, laser, but also the hair can be removed by shaving, waxing, threading, um, electrolysis, and just trimming. Um, we talked about the targeted treatments and genomics. Um, and I just wanted to highlight all of the, you know, Nevis Outreach is a wonderful organization for families. Um, there's also other um, kind of patient and family support resources that are out there as well, um, as well as sun protection. Um, uh, guidelines and uh, resources um, as well. Um, we did do a webinar on um, care of the congenital monocytic nevus in the newborn and infants um, through our Pediatric Research Alliance, um, PEDRA. Um, this is the link to that. Um, it's a great discussion amongst us pediatric dermatologists about this article. Um, and, um, there I'll just actually, uh, stop at that moment and, um, uh, thank you guys for, for your time and, um, open it up to some questions. Thank you so much. That was so in-depth. I feel like you covered so many of the questions that we had received in advance. Um, if anyone has any questions right now, you can put it in the chat. Um, the first one that we received says with NCM, can more lesions appear within the brain? Like in your practice, have you seen new lesions appearing in the brain just like they can for the skin? Mm -hmm. Oh, so that's a wonderful question. Um, uh, so um, the, you know, with NCM, you know, there can, we oftentimes um, recommend um, in MRI in that first kind of six months of, of age where we can kind of visualize the leptomeninges and the brain parenchyma a lot better uh, before myelination occurs. Um, but there have been kind of reports of sometimes NCM developing later on um, in an individual um, that either maybe was not, you know, picked up or um, evaluated um, or being able to see um, initially. So I think it's important to, you know, maybe get a repeat MRI at some um, at some point in time. You know, right now there's not any formal recommendation um, that we have or formal guidance. Uh, so in my practice, um, sometimes if the initial MRI is negative, I might during puberty, um, at times of growth, recheck an MRI. And oftentimes we don't have to do it at that point with general anesthesia. And then if an individual was symptomatic, so having any headaches, um, seizures, signs of increased, um, kind of pressure within the brain, hydrocephalus, um, 
or any developmental delays that might occur, it, it may be um, a good idea if, it, if there, those symptoms were to arise to get an MRI at that point in time. Awesome, great. Um, we had another person submit a question in advance asking if you had heard anything about red light therapy to help with scar healing or repigmentation. Mm. Um, I have not specifically heard of red light treatment um, in relation to congenital monastic nevi. Um, there is a lot of literature or, or a lot of um, kind of anecdotal anecdotal um, information about red light and maybe improving acne and scars. Um, but in general, um, uh, it's not um, kind of evidence-based. Um, and so uh, as far as the true effect, um, it's hard to comment on it completely. And then another question, what are the health risks of laser removal of a nevus? Yeah, so as far as um, the risks of laser treatment, the way the laser works is um, it targets the pigment within the hair follicle to get that hair follicle to kind of uh, stop growing, to um, arrest temporarily. And then when the hair comes, you know, in the next cycle of hair growth, the hair comes back thinner um, lighter in color, finer. Um, the main kind of risks of the procedure are, you know, it is a bit painful. It feels kind of like a rubber band snapping on the skin. Um, you, you know, to do an area the size of your palm for ha laser hair removal, it might take about, um, you know, 30 to 45 seconds, less than a minute. So it's not a long procedure, but um, it can feel, there can be some discomfort. Uh, you could, you know, putting energy into the skin, you could get a little small scab, a small scar or a blister, or some areas or light spots or dark spots in the surrounding skin. Um, but there's been no reports of increased kind of melanoma. There's no radiation to laser. Um, there's been no increased um, kind of malignant transformation within the nevus itself. Um, but it should be noted that it's oftentimes multiple treatments, um, kind of six to 10 done monthly to get the hair to kind of really stop growing in an area. And then it's not permanent removal of hair as well. So over time, sometimes over years, um, that hair can kind of come back. And then as far as laser to remove the, the nevus itself, um, it seems like the next question. Um, uh, so that, you know, the as some of the pictures showed in, in one of the articles, the lasers the, using pigmented lasers sometimes can lighten the nevus itself, um, but the laser doesn't penetrate very deeply into the skin. So the risk of the nevus coming back is pretty high. Um, so the risk of recurrence of the nevus coming back is high. And sometimes that can make it difficult to follow for um, for transformation to melanoma. So that's just one, one thing to kind of consider. Um, it does take multiple sessions as well to kind of achieve lightening. And even after multiple sessions, um, like in the, the picture that I showed, they had 15 sessions at individual, um, you know, sometimes there's still not complete kind of, uh, removal of all the pigmentation on the surface. And so it's something to kind of consider something to talk about patients for, and each session of laser is, is kind of painful. Thank you so much, Dr. Gupta. This has been an absolutely incredible session. We've learned so much. Um, for those of you who still have burning questions, we will get a chance to speak again with Dr. Gupta during the Ask the Experts Q&A happening in a couple of hours. It'll be right after the research and clinical trials at 4.25 p.m. Eastern. Um, so if you have any questions, you can bring them there. And up next as well will be the New Parents Virtual Meetup you'll have to hop over to another link. So check the attendee program and you can find the link there. Just want to thank Dr. Gupta once again. And Lily, if there's anything else you'd like to add. I think that's it, but thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much. And I apologize. I couldn't get my uh, video going. It wouldn't let me um, uh, start that, but I uh, appreciate being with you guys and I'll see you in a few hours. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Bye.